right ahead. The green button. Yeah. Good <laughs> evening from Ras Al Khaimah, the Northern it's Emirates. My recorded. next guest needs no introductions. Stephen, good morning in Manitoba. How are you? Good morning. I'm actually in New Brunswick. Brunswick, not New Manitoba. Brunswick. I used to live in Manitoba, but that was a while ago. But now I'm in New Brunswick, right. Eastern Canada. Lovely. Thank you very much for joining me and giving us your time. Um, I'm going to kick off by asking you um, a little bit about research, the research process. And um, what I'd really like your opinion on is how the research press has changed um, today with the use of all the digital infrastructures that we have at our fingertips. I mean, yeah, digital. It's changed dramatically. Mm. There's no such, yeah. There, there's no single thing as the research process. I, I think that's probably important to understand mm -hmm. right off the mm -hmm. top. Mm -hmm. Different disciplines have different research processes, and even within a discipline, the research processes may be, change, may be different. That said, traditionally, the research process was all paper-based, of course. Communications between researchers took place mostly in the form of academic journals, and conferences were intended primarily to present preliminary results. And what would be very common is a result would be presented at a conference. People would talk about it, argue about it. It might be presented at several conferences. Then it would be formalized into an academic paper and presented. This cycle has been dramatically mm -hmm. shortened by online methods. Uh, communication takes place between researchers on a daily basis. Results are shared well in advance of conferences, and indeed conferences have sort of shifted over the years to become more of a formal presentation of research results. Uh, additionally, the, the type of work that can be done has changed dramatically with digital technology. We'll look at, you know, just for example, the analysis of transcripts in an academic or an education environment, you know, education research, because mm -hmm. that's the sort of topic that we're into. And today you can use sophisticated data analysis tools, like for example EP, EPSS, mm -hmm. uh, which will scan for regularities and keywords and connections and the rest between and among the uh, communications written by students, which means that you can do a very in-depth analysis of what students are saying to each other in an online course in a way that you couldn't do before. So digital communication not only allows us to communicate more quickly, it also allows us to produce new kinds of data to use as part of our research. Thank you. Um Stephen, you're a great defender of, of open access and free education. Um, and what I wonder, uh, and I question, is whether um, if we have uh, open access, um, all open access documents, mm -hmm. um, unpublished manuscripts, blogs, which many today I feel are as good as what you can find in many academic journals because they're so up to date. Um, does this take away any value from the science? Or in other words, do you predict a loss of scientific value with all the free access, which is slowly every day becoming available to us? I think the science is better, not worse. There was an article I read yesterday, uh, and I actually ran it in my newsletter, talking about something called the macroscope. And the idea of the macroscope is that using online technologies and open access in particular, a researcher can almost at a single instant look across a wide range 
of experimental work. See results for many individuals and in many communities all at once. And that offers that person a different perspective on the research than they would be able to have simply working as an individual researcher in bilateral communication with other researchers. That's just one way open access makes research better. It also helps by, by opening communication beyond smallish communities of scientists and to the general public. This plays a significant role in educating the general public, obviously, but it also allows the general public to have some sort of input with respect to scientific research. And you might think, well, <laughs> what can the general public do with respect to scientific research? But just yesterday, I read an article about a new comet that was discovered. It's one of the, it's a sun grazing comet, which means that it has this long elliptical orbit and it comes in and it just grazes the outer uh, photosphere of the sun on its way around. So sun grazing comet, right? And it was discovered by an amateur. And, you know, as you know, large numbers of uh, objects in space have been discovered by amateurs. What people who are not scientists can bring to the table are numbers. Uh, there are thousands, tens of thousands, millions of them out there. They can look in places scientists can't look. They can be data collectors. They can be data and analyzers. There was the SETI project uh, a while back where they uh, allowed their computers to be used to process data. All of these sorts of things are ways that the wider population can become involved in, in science. So there are ways, we've seen two of them in my response so far, in which the opening of data, the opening of scientific inquiry actually improves science. Uh, against that, I'm not really seeing a downside. Uh, I don't believe that the value of scientific literature is created by its scarcity or created by making it difficult to access, quite the opposite, I think making it scarce and making it difficult to access makes it less valuable. Uh, and, and I don't see the value of scientific research being determined by the amount of money a publisher can charge for it. That's not the purpose of scientific literature in society. We don't hire all kinds of professors and researchers in order to create you know, some sort of input for publishers. We do it for social and public benefit. And the social and public benefit are served best by opening scientific literature to the people who, in the end, have paid for it. Absolutely. Um, I still feel, however, that open access threatens um, a lot of writers um, and academics. Um, I don't know if this will change, but there is still an element of threat, I, I, I think, and what, from what I see in different communities of the well, academic world. Can you world. expand on that? Like, how, how do you see it threatening them? Well, in the sense how, that... How do you see it threatening them? I'd well, if you don't this. pay for a journal, if a student doesn't pay, for example, for a journal, well, then that journal will not have the value, the articles in that journal will not have the value as articles in another journal where you actually have to pay a great deal or have to have access through a community or a university. And this creates a tremendous divide um, among people who are studying. For example, myself, um, if I choose to study, I will only have access, free access, to certain journals within my field of education and humanities and sociology if I am paying a university or if I'm paying a publisher. Um, there are free journals, um, and I do read them as well, but there is a, this, I, I still feel it creates a tremendous divide. Um, not everyone can afford um, the school fees for higher education today, and especially postgraduate education. Okay, now, from what I see out of what you've said, the divide here is created by the fact that there are some journals that you have to pay fees for. Imagine in a world where all the journals were free, where all 
the scientific journals were free, then there would be no divide, right? Uh, because everybody could access all the journals. So, and that said as well, there is nothing in the principle of open access that prevents people from buying journals if they want to. I mean, that, that would be a misunderstanding of what open access means. What open access means is encouraging that the supply of journals be freely accessible. But, you know, in the time before that supply does become freely accessible, it is still consistent with open access mm -hmm. to purchase uh, things that, that cost money. And then finally, I want to point out that the value of something is not determined by what people pay for it. And that's really easily provable. Air, for example, is free. Everybody receives air for free. Uh, that does not mean it is without value. It's, it's of infinite value. You could not live without it, right? <laughs> None of us could. And there are things that people pay for, a lot of money for, that are all out of proportion to their value. People paid money, for example, for Pet Rocks. People pay money for Justin Bieber albums. Okay, I'm just kidding with that last one, but you know what I mean, right? People pay lots of money for things that aren't worth very much. That's very common. So, you know, you, you have to, I think, separate between the value of something and the cost of something. The, the cost of something is typically determined not by what it's worth, not by what effort was put into the creation of it, but by what the market will bear, right? It's the willingness of people to pay money that creates a cost of something and nothing else, right? If people aren't willing to pay that amount of money, then that cost cannot be sustained. It will never be sustained. So part of open access is an attempt to decrease the willingness of people to pay money for academic research. And we do that by making available open access academic research. And the better this open access academic research gets, the, the more high quality papers are published openly, the less willing people are to pay for commercial research. And so the price comes down. So even if there is commercial research in an open access environment, because the price is coming down, that makes it less of a burden for people to purchase okay. rather than more of a burden. Mm -hmm. One final thing, uh, open access still allows authors to be paid. This is especially true in scientific literature because authors now, even now, when they submit a journal article to a commercial journal, are not paid for that article. They don't receive any money from it. In fact, sometimes they pay the journal to publish the article. So open access is not going to reduce in any way, shape, or form the amount of money that an academic can receive for publishing. Uh, for publishing journal articles. It may reduce the, the amount slightly by what, uh, of what they receive for publishing books. But if you ask any academic who actually publishes a book, and I've spoken to many, that's only a very, very small part of their income. Academics make their income from the institutions that hire them, including me. I'm hired by the National Research Council. Terry Anderson is hired by Athabasca University, etc. They pay the academic salary. And so open access does not change a person's ability to earn money by being an academic. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you. Um, however, as you know, there's always been this notion that you pay for knowledge or knowledge has its price. And I, I think that that's changing dramatically and very quickly today. 
uh, with open access, um, with everything that's available for whoever yes. wants to. And um, yeah, so I, I deeply and mostly appreciate it. Stephen, we've been talking about researchers and academics. Um, I'm a teacher. I happen to teach in higher education. I've taught in companies. Uh, I also taught for a very brief time at secondary education level many years ago. And my impression here in this corner of the world um, is that connectivism is something that's spoken a lot about, discussed, referred to mostly in online communities, Twitter, uh, the MOOCs, and other networks. Right. I feel that connectivism has so much to give to common, regular classroom teachers. How can we explain to them or and put across how important connectivism is in their classroom, in their daily practice? Yeah, that's a hard question because connectivism wasn't designed for classroom use. And when we were thinking about connectivism, we weren't really thinking about the classroom. Mm. But that said, I would say that if, if I was talking to a classroom teacher about the value of connectivism to their work, I would say mostly it's about changing their perspective mm -hmm. on what they do, and, and especially their perspective with respect to the resources that they have available to them. And this is something that would be known to a certain extent by most classroom teachers today. Connectivism is about making connections, which kind of makes sense, right? And it's about making connections not only between individual learners with each other, although that's certainly a big part of it, but also making connections between learners and, and people external to a classroom, external to the learning environment, as well as making connections between learners and resources, services, etc., that may be available either in the classroom or online. And the change in perspective that I would say connectivism recommends to teachers is to see themselves not as located in a classroom interacting with a group of 20 or 30 students with a certain finite set of resources like the textbook and the exercises that they work from, but to see themselves and their students as embedded in this worldwide network and to see interactions with that network forming the core of the learning process in the classroom. So it shifts the focus a bit, right? It shifts the focus from being centered on each other in the classroom to be to one where you're looking from the classroom out at the world. Now, the intent of that is not to break the classroom into 30 individual people looking out at the world. The classroom itself now becomes a nexus. It now becomes uh, a cluster of linkages between people, each of whom has a unique perspective on the world outside. So the idea is you encourage each individual and, and the teacher as well to draw connections between themselves and resources and people, etc., outside, and then you bring back those connections from the outside world into the classroom environment and share that with other people in the classroom. And it's this process of sharing, this process of exchanging these connections, these links with each other, that creates uh, a significant part of the learning process. Through that process of sharing, we would also expect a process of creativity to occur, uh, where people bring in resources, they work with these resources, they work with the ideas, the concepts, the tools, whatever is relevant 
for the discipline that they're studying, and then in turn, share those with the outside world. And that's the second part of the learning in a connectivist environment in the classroom. This is very much the model of learning that we are using in the massive open online course. And the classroom is like a massive open online course, except it's micro, and that's fine. Right, but Stephen, this has tremendous, tremendous impact on the role of the teacher, the role of the learner, and their identity. Tremendous. So yeah. what advice, what recommendation could you give to make this transition softer, <laughs> easier for people who may want to begin <laughs> opening up their classroom walls? It's, um, I don't think it's simple I, for someone I mean, to change their yeah. role, to change their role from one week well, it's to not another. Simple. I don't know, I'm not going to pretend it's simple. It's yeah. a hard thing. <laughs> yeah. What I recommend to people is before they try to convert their class, back here. I don't know why, but before before people try to convert their class, that, that might have done it. Okay. Uh, they should focus on their own individual learning and professional development. Uh, I, I think Uvu is doing that. Okay. Yeah, Uvu is behaving. Are you hearing feedback as well? No, all is clear here. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll continue. Okay, good. It must just be here. All right. Uh, I, I tell them to focus on their own individual learning and professional mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. And I tell them to create their own learning network out of the resources that are available to them online. And in this way, to connect to other people, other teachers probably, mm -hmm. but not necessarily, who are involved in the same sort of work that they're involved in. Mm -hmm. In the first instance, this now results in a sharing of information, a sharing of resources, ideas, etc. In the second instance, this gives them practical experience themselves first mm. as a network learner, right? They are learning themselves how to learn in this environment before they ever even try it on students. If you just try it on students before doing it yourself, you know, the likelihood of, of you know, doing it incorrectly or making mistakes or simply, you know, feeling lost is that much greater. The third thing is, as these network connections grow, you find that you can specialize into certain roles or, or certain skill sets. Mm -hmm. Some people, for example, may specialize in uh, you know, creating videos for other people to use. Other people may specialize in moderating discussion boards. Other people may specialize in the coaching aspect of learning online. This means that when you do move your classroom to an online environment, you're moving it into an environment where not only the students have other people they can draw on for support, mm -hmm. so does the teacher. And so you can imagine, instead of having three teachers each with 30 students trying to do everything, now you have three teachers working, working together with a total enrollment of 90 students, where these 90 students may be in three separate countries, and these three teachers are each doing some part of the instruction, some part of the uh, support for learning, and as, as a group together are able to provide a much more comprehensive support for the entire 90 students. This is really common. Uh, this, this is not something that, that should be surprising. And, and again, this is the approach we take in our massive open online courses where we have 
for example, in the change MOOC, which is happening right now, we have Dave Cormier in Prince Edward Island, myself here in New Brunswick, and George Siemens in Alberta. So three provinces and four time zones, or three time zones apart, and we're each focusing on different areas of the course, and that allows us to support 2,200 people. So you can see how once the teacher has this network support, the capacity of the teacher greatly increases. So to ease the transition, first develop the network support. First, start learning yourself on the network, and only later think about using it on your classroom when you're comfortable with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Stephen, um, there, there is something that's been troubling me a bit lately, and um, I am a great defender of digital learning, and I try to introduce it as much as possible and whenever it's appropriate in my practices. Um, but I've come to the point where I cringe every time I hear e-learning, and I wish to say it is learning. It is not specifically e-learning, it is learning and concepts which we read every day, um, very important concepts, um, learner autonomy, uh, lifelong learning. It comes across as if it's something that is only the 21st century. And um, I started teaching in the 20th century. <laughs> I was born in the 20th century. Um, and I don't feel that it is a 21st century characteristic. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not alone on that. Um, do you think that yeah, we've come to a point where... I, I get that, and we should, I understand that. But do you think it's still important, this connotation of e-learning, or is it too early to move on because we're in the middle of the shift of paradigm, or has the paradigm hat shifted already? Well, I read an article online this morning about the loss of students' abilities to write in what's called cursive script. You know, writing instead of printing. And it was funny because uh, the article said that, you know, if they don't have this ability to write in cursive script, uh, they will lose their ability to read documents like the Declaration of Independence, which are written in cursive. And they'll lose their connection to the authors of these documents. And it occurred to me as I read that, that you know, the authors of these documents wrote them more than 200 years ago, they're not connected to them anymore. And maybe it's a mistake to think that they are. Uh, changes like that characterize at least part of the difference between learning with computers and learning without computers. Uh, you know, and that, that may change again. For now, we use keyboards and text rather than handwriting and script. And that's fairly significant. You know, it's a different way of communicating. Uh, typing an essay using a word processor is a different form of authoring than even typing an essay with a typewriter. Even typing an essay with a typewriter with a corrector ribbon. I once wrote a very short poem, and this is the world debut of this poem. Um, it's, it's entitled, On the Experience of Typing Using a Corrector Ribbon. And the poem is, Those who make mistakes are condemned to repeat them. And that's the poem. It's a very short poem. Uh, so, but you see what I mean, right? And then you keep in mind, uh, in, in years before, people would handwrite their essays. They would actually handwrite their essays. Wittgenstein wrote all of his books on little index cards, 
handwritten, and then he'd organize his index cards. That was a very forward-thinking way of authoring. You know, and I can remember handwriting papers that I submitted. You know, certainly in high school, they were all handwritten. They didn't allow typewritten papers, <laughs> uh, if you can believe that. And then in university, of course, I, I hand wrote some. I, I was, you know, I started university, I was handwriting, shifted to typewriter, and then by the time I was out of university, I was using a computer. It was that, you know, that five year period was the transition from handwriting to computer. Mm -hmm. And and that was the 19, about 1981 I started. And, and uh, when I finished, it was, uh, well, the last year I was working on it was 93. So that, that, but actually my undergraduate, 85 to 86, or sorry, 81 to 86, that's the time frame that this happened. Mm. So it's interesting. I'm learning a completely different style of writing just in those five year period, just in that five year period of university. That's just one example of how the is a change in the digital versus the pre-digital uh, era of learning. I can talk about a lot more, but I'll, I'll, I'll highlight one I think is really important. Pre-digital, there's a certain upper limit on the number of people we can talk to, the number of sources we can contact, the amount of data we can access, the upper limit's pretty high. Uh, you, you know, you look at the New York City phone book, right? It's got like, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of phone numbers in it. So the upper limit is pretty high. But there's still an upper limit, and that upper limit is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, not huge. It's not in the billions. It's not in the trillions, right? But now we work, or can work, because not everybody does, uh, with data records containing millions of records. Uh, my website, I, I, I turned on the statistics for my website in June uh, because there's some guy in Fredericton boasting that he's the most read <laughs> blogger in the province, which I find ridiculous. <laughs> and after, I don't know, 10 years, he's finally gotten a million hits. So I turned on my statistics thing in June and just went over a million. So I've, I've got a million records records uh, in my, uh, it's, uh, what do you call that thing? It's just the uh, the, the, the server logs, right? Mm -hmm. A million records. That's a huge amount of data. Plus, this data can be connected to other data. I've got a system in my, um, in my uh, Grasshopper script now that looks at all the incoming blogs, scans them, takes the links apart, maps the links to each other, maps these links to the authors, maps the authors to other authors to publications, and then takes all of that and maps it to subjects. Millions of records. All right. I have no hope of comprehending that in, tradi in a traditional way. But more to the point, the nature of the data itself changes when you begin working on this kind of scale. And, and a slightly simplistic way of presenting it is, in the past, things were complicated. They were made up of many parts, but you could understand them by taking them apart, looking at the parts, looking at how the parts were put together. It was traditional analysis, right? And, and traditional research was, you know, analysis and synthesis. Take things apart, look at how they work, and that gives you the story of how they all work together. When we're working with, you know, huge data sets with variables that impact on each other, so they're not they're not independent variables, they're mutually dependent variables. The value of one variable depends on the value of another Another, the value of the other variable depends on the first. And that's, you know, we have human relations are like that, right? Whether I like you depends on whether you like me. Whether you like me depends on whether I like you. You know how that can become confusing mm -hmm. in a hurry. 
right? Now you do it with three people, now you do it with four people, right? So you can't just look at individual people. You can't just take apart a society and look at the individuals to find out who likes who. You have to see how they're all working together. So the old data where you can take it apart and analyze it, that's complicated data. The new data where you can't simply take it apart, that's complex data. Mm -hmm. In complicated data, you have rules, you have principles, you can have laws of nature, you can use mathematics to express the relations among the parts. In complex data, you don't have any of this. You can't even do good old fashioned cause and effect because you know, think about the question, uh, what causes one person to like another? Well, who knows? There's all kinds of things that could have an impact. So the, the very best you can do is a rough kind of generalization. You know, well, Fred mostly likes blonde people. You know, and so often these generalizations are, are wildly false. So as a result of transitioning from pre-computer to post-computer knowledge, we are moving from an era of complicated systems, complicated understandings, analysis, rules, laws of nature, to a new system of complex systems, complex organizations, where simple stories like cause and effect and laws of nature no longer apply. So the way we understand them and the way we think about them changes. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the old system, we would use analysis to do uh, laws of nature. In the new system, we want to use macroscopic uh, perception in order to identify patterns. Uh, identify regularities in the data, kind of like watching the weather, right? Mm -hmm. If you watch the weather, you can't analyze every individual cloud particle, every individual water particle. You have to look at the weather and watch the overall patterns. But you notice the predictability goes down and mm -hmm. the cause and effect goes down. It's a different way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference. And it's not precisely at the year 2000 that this difference came into play. Uh, in my life, the difference came into play between the years of 1981 and 1986, when I went from handwriting my early essays in my first year to writing them on computer in my fifth year. Yes, I took five years to do my undergrad. Uh, <laughs> but, but then again, I was going from handwriting to computing. Nobody ever measures that. Right? So it's, for me, that's, you know, the, the 20th century was before 1980, uh, I don't know, 83, 84, uh, and the 21st century was after. If you want to put it on a scale globally, the 20th century was before 1989, and the 21st century was after 1989. 1989 is characterized as the year when these massive, very complex, connective kind of movements began to take form and they started overthrowing governments. And, you know, so we, we saw the world become this complex environment where before it was just a complicated environment. So, you know, I think there is something to be said about 21st century learning. But it's not a simple thing. It's not a, well, you just need to use computers or you, you, know, you, you, you just need to learn how to use social networks. That kind of representation is, is a very superficial, very simplistic representation of what is a really a very difficult phenomenon to understand. Uh, in my own work, I've tried to understand I was almost going to say analyze, but that would be a mistake, right? I was trying to understand 21st century learning in terms of six major frames or six major perspectives. Again, not six major parts, not six major elements, just six major ways of seeing the same sort of phenomena. And that'd be syntactically through patterns, regularities, paradigms, archetypes, etc. Semantically, which is meaning, value, or 
origins, goals, purpose. Uh, pragmatically, which has to do with the context uh, or placement uh, of, of whatever you're doing. Uh, another type of pragmatically, which has to do with the use to which you put knowledge, the use to which you put signs, information, etc. Cognitively, which has to do with the inferences that you draw, the explanations that you make, even the way you define words mm -hmm. or describe the scene in front of you. And then finally, with respect to change, understanding trends, understanding scheduling, understanding dynamics. Those are six major frames for looking at complex phenomena. None of them is you know, prior to the others. None of them is foundational. They all mm -hmm constitute different ways of looking at the world. And then through these different ways of looking at the world, we, we have the different kinds of ac academic disciplines, the different kinds of understandings. An artist will see patterns, for example. Um, a politician will see change and change agents and processes of change. Uh, a, you know, a, a lawyer or a priest will see values and goals and objectives and underlying meaning. So the different ways we look at the world also represent different things that we can do with the world and with each other. I think that's a very different kind of understanding than the kind of understanding we had in the past where we do a scientific experiment, we test the environment. Remember you asked the first question, right, was how does research change? Here's how research changes, right? We used to go, and, and so many education journals still do this, right? You have an environment or a system, mm. you change a variable in that system and then try to measure the result. That's the old way, right? That's the analysis way of understanding a phenomena. It will give you old data, 20th century data. Uh, it'll give you regularities and abstractions that are mm. almost certainly either misrepresentative or outright false. Stephen, so um, that's how I think 21st century knowledge is different from 20th. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that, Stephen. Just to to, to wrap up, um, I'd like to ask you what advice, what recommendation you would give to um, educators, whether in whatever level, primary, secondary, higher education. What advice, what recommendation would you give them for them to become less hesitant? Um, in my experience, I still feel and still know um, academics um, and educators who are reluctant to expose themselves because it's risky. Um, they they still are not fully aware of the importance it is to have a digital identity, to have an active and participating digital role um, for themselves, uh, for their learners, for their community. What advice would you give? Mm -hmm. Well, it's up to them. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I don't believe at all in trying to convince people of the right way to do something. And I, I know that sounds ironic, but if, it, <laughs> if you actually sat down and ran through, you know, ran one of these linguistic mm. analysis on the text that I've just given you, you'd see that what I say is true, that what, what I say is descriptive, what I do is I say what I would do, uh, you know, if, if somebody asked me, here's what I might tell them. You know, the idea that there's one correct way to do your job is, in my view, a relic of the past, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's still perfectly appropriate, even in 2011, for people to use the non-technological way of learning. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep in mind that uh, the education system is a high value system. Mm -hmm. If we get this wrong, 
civilization collapses. You know, I mean, the bankers if, got it if, wrong. If, if for some reason, all of our education <laughs> switched over to the digital system. Pardon? The bankers didn't get it that right. They got it a bit wrong. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you see, this, this is interesting, right? Banking is less important to society than education mm. by orders of magnitude, right? <laughs> bankers got it wrong and destroyed the economy. If educators get it wrong, they really make a mess of things yeah. really badly. You know, if everybody switched to online learning and then it proved that online learning was a terrible way to do things, we'd be in serious trouble. So there's a lot to recommend conservatism in mm. education. And I'm all over that. You, you wouldn't think, right? Because, you know, I mean, I'm right on the cutting edge of technology. You know, I fling programs around for fun. Literally, you know, just for fun. Uh, but, geez, I wouldn't want every teacher to be doing this, right? I have a lot of confidence in my own beliefs and my own ideas, but not so much confidence that I want everybody in the world to start doing them now. That would be ridiculous. That would be totally ridiculous. Anybody who says something like that doesn't understand what they're talking about because nobody, no individual, no group has such a firm grasp on the truth that they can recommend that everybody do such and such. So I think there's a value in diversity. I think there's a value in different ways of approaching learning. And therefore, I think there's a value not only in, in you know, using digital technologies, but also in being the holdout and not using digital technologies. And it's okay, because this person who doesn't do it will eventually retire. And that's, you know, and, and then they won't be not using digital technologies, right? They'll be replaced by somebody who's using something new. You know, as Thomas Kuhn said, uh, you know, old paradigms, are not overturned, they die off with their adherence. And he's quite right. You know, the, you know when, when people came to the realization that the earth was not flat, oh. that it was in fact round, this happened not because all the flat earthers were convinced that it was round. They were not convinced. They went to their grave believing that they lived on a flat earth. What happened is over time, and it took a long time, the number of new learners believing that the Earth was round outnumbered the number of new learners believing the Earth was flat. And there's probably still pe people out there who believe the Earth is flat and power our them. And just I just tell them, be careful when you go sailing. <laughs> you know, uh, so I would say the best way to encourage people is to find the people who are already interested, who want to do something and help them move along, rather than to try to convince somebody who isn't interested. Mm -hmm. right? Help those who are interested. They will be the model and the example for other people to follow. Eventually, if it's a good model, other people might, you know, tentatively, you know, Take some of it. You know, yeah, I might want some of that email thing I've been hearing of. Oh, you want email? Okay, I'll set that up for you. You know what I mean? Uh, but they have to ask for it. You know, you're forcing technology on people, forcing anything on people is a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, you create resilient progress. So it moves fast enough as it is. You know, we, we don't need to get out behind and push. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's no real rush here. I, I really don't think there's a rush here. And, and students, students will be exposed to technology. Mm -hmm. They will have a wide range of learning opportunities, no matter what happens in their grade five chemistry class. They will. So. That chemistry class can be less than perfect. It's okay.
you know i mean it always has been less than perfect trust me and it can continue to be less than perfect for a few more years and society won't collapse and we'll all be fine so that would be my best advice stephen downs thank you very much for your time for sharing so much with us and i'd like to wish you a very good day thank you very much Thank you. You too. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye for now.